I think we, we should start. Um, sorry guys, uh, my name is Chong and I am a Hong Kong based artist, but now in, I'm in Beijing uh, where I just opened a show in Hive um, uh, Center for Contem Contemporary Art in Beijing 798 District. And that was, that is one of um, my first solo show in mainland China uh, that happened in a very tricky and interesting time. So I believe that is a very good chance to share my experience showing mainland China and also uh, also about my practice, like how I present or how the, um, the space, the art gallery presents me as a Hong Kong artist at this critical time. And uh, initially I plan to have like divided the studio visit into two times, like, even though this, um, this program, like, thank you so much um, Parasite for inviting me for the studio visit which um, gave a big support for um, uh, Hong Kong artists. Uh, we are so poor, so we, we receive a very good chance to uh, publicize ourselves and also receive uh, some support for pro producing our future projects. Uh, initially, I plan to divide it into two parts. Uh, one is about me introducing my, uh, my ongoing show in Beijing. And the, the other part, I may um, I may have a discussion with uh, the participants and also Marta and Chita and also Angie. Um, but it seems like the Wi-Fi connection and also the, the network connection is not very good. So uh, I may just show the installation documentation photos uh, on my share screen and also played some of the videos in the show. So you guys have a, fair, uh, a clear uh, look on, on the details of the work. Um, but feel free to like, raise your hands and ask questions. And uh, if I'm not clear, please let me know. Um, uh, Anxi, should I introduce myself uh, or should uh, Mata and Chita introduce themselves? Yeah, first? sure. Maybe uh, let me briefly introduce um, Chita and also Mata. And also for people uh, who are not familiar with this program. <laughs> Uh, I'm Anchi Lee. I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs at Parasite Hong Kong, and uh, we have been doing uh, student visits uh, in the past uh, three months now, um, and uh, we're really trying to uh, increase the exposure of um, artists who are based uh, in Hong Kong uh, and also like have programs um, uh, in or beyond Hong Kong. So today we have the greatest pleasure of uh, having um, Chung, uh, Li Kai Chung, um, to do the student visit and uh, very happy to, his, uh, to see his current exhibition in Beijing right now. And today um, I want to introduce two special uh, moderators for everybody, um, Chita and also Mata, who are our current participants of Parasite workshops for emerging art professionals. So through this workshops, uh, we are um, calling for curators, writers, researchers from all over the world to join Hong Kong but this year actually online and due to the COVID situation um, to think about how uh, we can change um, um, the, the curation world and how um, we can improve our skill set. So without further ado, Mata and Chita, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Marta Cacciavillani. I'm an independent curator and I recently uh, relocated uh, to Milan in Italy, where I'm originally from. Um, and I'm, thank you very much, Parasite, for giving us the opportunities to like get to know Chang a little bit more and his work. Um, and yeah, I think I can just wrap it up here. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Parasite. Thank you, Anshi. Sorry it's a, if it's a little bit noisy. There's a prayer call right now. I'm Chita. I'm based in Jakarta or Bandung, Indonesia. I'm an art manager. And so, yeah, I'm very excited because I don't know much about Hong Kong art scene or Hong Kong art history. And I'm very excited to learn more about it from Chung. Thank you, Mata, and thank you, Chita. So Chung, would you like to um, tell us a little bit more uh, about your current practice, the show, and then we can move into um, the conversation with our two moderators. Uh, yes. Uh, 
I, I may start with um, what I thought about uh, yesterday. I, yesterday, I took a long walk um, from the gallery after um, I finished the tour and also a discussion with my friends in, uh, in Hive. And then um, I, because right now we are in pandemics, right? So we have to show our QR code, uh, the health codes whenever we enter uh, a restaurant or um, a supermarket. So I, I, I chose to just have a walk. Uh, outside, and I keep thinking about my own practice as an uh, as a person or artist. And in the past, I always introduced myself um, a guy who worked with um, history and also archive. Uh, archive is a big concept that it includes a lot of things: um, the documents, the institute, the whole system, so on and so forth. But at the same time. Um, Friends from Hong Kong and also my curator's friend, um, they give me very good suggestions or advice that um, they, they say, oh, you, when you are working on archive, you encounter a lot of limitations. What, what will you do if you don't have any, you can't get access to the archival material? So are you still claiming you are working with the archive? Or how can you prove the authenticity, uh, authenticity of the archival material. Uh, how can you say that is true? And um, when you have nothing, um, how can you work on your own project? I, so um, at the end, uh, after the long walk, I, I kind of like conclude um, that I, I, like my working methodology is, is from the long practice of working with archive, but for me, when I'm concerned with a particular historical events or the political situations uh, of the topic that I'm concerned with, I, I, talk, uh, or I, I take the archival methodologies from my uh, recent practice and I thought into uh, my research or artistic practice. I can elaborate more um, later on when I um, explained the two projects that I, uh, I just finished and present in, in Hive in the solo show and also the upcoming projects that I'm going to do in the, in the near future, maybe in the next, let me see, uh, 10 years, because I expect I will finish the whole five series of projects by 2013, if I still alive. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with, um, start with my exhibitions. Sounds good. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at, I'm not super great at. Let's um, switch gears. Okay, got it, right? You guys see it. <laughs> so this is the um, um, installation view of um, one of the galleries in my solo show. Um, I, my practice is consist with um, moving images, um, documents, um, sculpture, uh, photography, um, or something else, like basically a mix of everything. But um, I, when, when I studied in primary school in, in like long, long time ago, like my, my, my teacher gave me um, a, a, a comment on my academic results, uh, the, the, book, the booklet say, oh, you are the person that you can never focus on anything. So that's why your uh, academic marks is so low. So I, I but at the end, I, I, I realized that that is one of my interests, like, because I, I like to um, just post everything on the same page. So I can see the connections that is not normally being presented, uh, no matter it's on, on the paper or on the documents or on the archive or in the mainstream historical narrative. Uh, I, I, may use the, I often use the word historiography, the way that uh, narrate history in form of anything, like in form of uh, verbal or in form of uh, writing. Uh, the exhibition consists of two projects. Uh, I, I can elaborate more later. But I, before I talk about my, my own practice or the projects, um, I, I can like, briefly um, share one of my ex uh, most variable experience when I showed in Beijing this time. Uh, two years ago, I participated in uh, Shanghai Biennale in 2018. And I, 
I propose these projects, uh, the projects in, in, this, uh, in this photograph to um, PSA. And, and the curators, they, are really uh, they were really happy to see that and they're really excited just because that was a commission work. Uh, at the same time, I received an award in Hong Kong, WMA commissions that provide financial and also um, other support to, to make it happen. But at the end, um, the, the Biennale uh, received uh, a call from the Cultural Bureau that they have to censor this work, that I, I, do, I did not have the chance to show this work in the Biennale, um, just because uh, a few, just because of a few reasons. Um, because I mentioned about Japanese occupation, uh, Hong Kong, um, uh, colonial era, uh, British Hong Kong, and also um, the last but the least, um, the identity of, identity of Hong Kong people. Um, for me, I was really shocked because I, for me, I, I don't feel like, like at, at first, I didn't uh, self-censor myself. I just do whatever I feel like I have to do with it. Um, second, I don't feel like that is that sensitive, but at the same time, if, um, I, I fully acknowledged that uh, when we reach a certain level that it may touch a point um, um, like, sen like they, what, what they claimed a sens uh, sensitive issues, it may mean something to me that I have to reveal my work and also my practice and I have to see whether I'm going on the uh, right track. And before I showing in Beijing, this time, my friends asked me the same questions. Like, are you afraid you will be get censored again? I have to say thank you to Hive, they, uh, because the curators and also the director um, of Hive, they give me a lot of support from the very beginning until now. And they, I, this is what I heard like a few days ago before, uh, the day before the opening um, uh, 798, uh, the National Enterprise, uh, they asked the officers to come to check if everything was okay. And I, I think that uh, they, they support me and also try to persuade the local officers that like, it's, not, it's nothing against, like, I don't know, like, against the policy or something like that. But at the same time, whenever we lived in, um, in a world like this, um, we have to fully aware it, um, uh, what is going on. At the same time, we have to keep doing that, uh, something that we believed. So, um, so this is what I'm experiencing. Uh, at the third experience that happened a um, few days ago, uh, no, a few weeks ago, I, I also participate in another exhibition in Japan. Um, my work was, uh, was initially censored just because I mentioned about uh, war history of J uh, Japanese occupation during the Second World War. Um, the director of the gallery, they, was, um, they were worried that because the exhibition was supposed to schedule during the Olympic Games 2000, 2020, uh, this year in the summer. But like, of course, everyone know um, the game the games were uh, canceled because of pandemics. Um, so I have to say, like, we always encounter censorship, just, not just me, but um, a lot of artists in the mainland China and also in Asia all over the world. And this, this is one of the biggest, I have to say, like, one of the biggest obstacles apart from we make a living as an artist, but at the same time, we, we have to cope with um, situation like that. And, I believe uh, many artists, they, they stay very strong. At the same time, we stay together that we do not self-censor ourselves. And also we, we have to keep, keep our practice no matter what. So uh, I, that even though this is a very long beginning, a uh, long opening for, for the, um, for the explana explanation, but um, these experiences really inspire me to keep me going. Um, <laughs> um, I, yeah, maybe I start, I, I talk too much. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm sorry if I'm 
uh, interesting how you said that like you want to adjust in a way with you know, the reality um, that you're facing, but at the same time, like keep going and believing what you're doing and what, you know, um, other artists like you're working with or other artists everywhere are doing just like how to kind of like adjust yourself without kind of changing the work. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's super important and relevant. Yeah. And, and if I may just add, like if people have any comments or thoughts or questions, be, please feel free to just like, you know, use the chat box and then we can share it with the rest of the audience and use them as a kind of point of discussions throughout the, the studio visit. Oh, sorry, uh, Marta, I have to add a little note. Um, I, I think like artists always face a lot of pressure from the authority, but at the same time, without the support of the Institute and also the curators and also um, yeah, other art practitioners, artists, they are really vulnerable to, to that kind of pressure. So um, I, yeah, I think like, we have to stay together. Um, yeah, let, let me start with uh, my project. Uh, the first project in, uh, oh, I should put that. Uh, after I finished the first project in 2019, I, did, decided, I decided I have to make five projects in, in a road in order to deliver it, the whole narrative. So uh, what I'm working with, what, what I'm working on right now is mainly about the notion of displacement, something or someone who were forced to leave their original um, country or the, the, um, the habitants into other places, no matter they return to their original country or not, or they stay, to, uh, stay in, that, um, in that place and, and live. Um, what I'm concerned with is about displacement. Uh, all these uh, five projects, they share the same uh, ideology. The first project I, I start in 2018, which is called Retrieval, um, Restoration and Predicaments. During the Second World War, um, uh, before the Second World War, uh, Hong Kong has, um, the center of Hong Kong is called Central, right? So uh, it's Hong Kong Island. And in Hong Kong Island, there there were um, 10 uh, bronze statues in Statue Square, where it's just in front of um, HSBC, the bank right now. So when Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese during, uh, in 1941, so the Japanese uh, seized these bronze statues and brought them to Japan because during the war, um, the Japanese was running out of um, metals because metals is essential for building weapons, tanks, and bullets. So they, by the time they have a movement called um, contributing uh, metals or bronze movement uh, in home island in Japan and also in all their colonies. So um, these statues, they are mainly um, the royal family. Um, what is the most well known is the Queen Victoria statues. Um, so after the war in 1945, uh, when Japanese surrendered, the uh, United um, United uh, no the American army they found four remaining statues in Tokyo Bay, and then they informed the British Hong Kong government and asked them whether you want to uh, retrieve those statues. So uh, those statues they were oh these um, are the images of. Uh, the Queen Victoria statue when it was retrieved. But, uh, but you, you can see, um, actually Life magazine, they, they kind of flipped, um, flipped the, the image when they prophesized this uh, because the, the left hand is, uh, is the scepter. So um, what were left- so We're the looking at the, the installation. Is oh. that the right image? Oh, sorry. You can- you can maybe quit and then do share screen again. Oh, oh. yeah. Okay, my thoughts. No worries. Yeah, oh. this is the right one. <clears throat> All right. Am I, are you seeing the PowerPoint? Yes. 
Thank you. Okay, yeah, this is the, the project that I'm working on. And this is um, how Queen Victoria statue was retrieved <coughs> after the Second World War. So when, um, when the British Hong Kong retrieved those statues, including um, the Queen Victoria statues and two uh, HSBC lions, and also Tom, uh, Sir Thomas Jackson, um, the chief manager of HSBC. And then uh, the British Hong Kong, the colony encountered another situation in a very deep financial predicament because after the war, uh, in, like, most of the uh, money and also the variables was captured by the Japanese and, and took it back to um, Japan and also other colonies. So Hong Kong was really poor, but at the same time, like the, the statue represents um, the sovereignty of the colony and also uh, UK. So um, in order to retrieve and also restore these statues, um, the UK government have to um, raise funds. But um, the corporates, HSBC refused to, um, to donate money to, to retrieve, uh, to restore these statues. So uh, Hong Kong government have to raise funds through public auctions because by the time uh, HSBC building was occupied by Japanese as the headquarter. So um, uh, the variables in, um, in the safe, uh, the Gatman in the safe was captured by the Japanese. At the same time, Japanese transport variables from other colonies to Hong Kong. So af after, um, after the second world war, I, from the records in public records office in Hong Kong, I see there's a list of material found in HSBC safe, in underground, the wealth, that was not belong to Hong Kong. For example, opium and um, other jewelries and also other weaponry. So, um, but after the war, Hong Kong, in order to raise funds, they sold the opium to Singapore. So that is a very interesting story. Let me share, okay, let me share another. So in this work, um, at first, oh, are you guys seeing the exhibition installation view? Yes. Okay. At first, I tried to study um, how the Queen, uh, Queen Victoria statue, which is the major focus of my project, uh, now is sitting in the Victoria Park in Hong Kong. I really want to study it, I, how the details or how the losing parts they were re uh, re uh, restored after the Second World War. And I asked the Hong Kong government that I, I send them email and give them phone call that I really want to do um, uh, a 3D scan of the statute. But um, after a few back and forth and discussion, the officer told me, oh, Mr. Lee, you are not allowed to approach or move close to the statue um, just, to be, just because, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Just because on the photo on the, on the right, um, that was kind of like a hidden agenda of the conversation. During the 60s in Hong Kong, there was a 67 uh, leftist riot in Hong Kong. And, and, and uh, demonstrators, they, they kind of um, smeared and, and, and painted slogans on, uh, on, on the statue. And also in 1996, um, Chinese artist Pan Xinglu, he splashed red playing and also um, hammered the nose of the Queen statue. So that's why it make um, the, the government officers very paranoid whenever there's artists really want to study or work with, <laughs> I put the quote and quote work with, uh, the Queen statue, they, they get very nervous. So, um, and that's why I cannot approach, I cannot like even get close to the pedestrian of the Queen statue. So um, instead, okay, wait a minute. Instead, I took um, many uh, photographs of the Queen statue. And at last, I, I merged those photographs and make it into a 3D model. So, um, the angle that I photographed the statue is from bottom to uh, from bottom to up, 
that it documents uh, the 3D model actually is smash or make it like a, the, the proportion is not right. Uh, because I want to keep how we see the statue as a like a visitor to to the park at the same time how I cannot um, get close to the statue and study it and so I, at last I print uh, I make it into a wax model and then uh, and cast the, the lost parts of the statue into bronze statue and then and put it into in the exhibition hall but um and apart from the statue itself, I really want to document and also present the archival materials I, I got during the research uh, process. So I, I took quite a number of videos and at first I didn't know how I should put together those materials. And I, I also always struggle how I present those informations, um, especially like the, the name of the place and number of money, they, uh, the amount of money they, uh, the government spent and also so on and so forth. But um, after a few months of researching into, uh, in Hong Kong Public Records Office and also from the online archive of National Archives in UK, I realized that like why the, uh, the archival materials, the documents, the records, they, uh, they do not talk much about the existence of human being. So like, where are the people? Um, do they, I mean like, because in the official exchanges of those records, um, the way that they speak or they write is very formal. It's according to how uh, a civil servant should do uh, in that kind of exchanges. But at the same time, I feel like, what, what is the value? I keep asking myself the same questions. So what is the value of history? What's the value of um, presenting a history through artwork? And that, that is one of my biggest um, struggle in all times. But at the end, I, I feel like what, like my personal interest is always about how people see that history and how that piece of history is being narrated through different medium. For example, archive is one of the mediums um, or Oral history is another very, um, very good medium because it tells a lot about the emotion of the interviewees and also um, how, how the time really affects the interviewees talk about their own lives and also how memory changes over time. So at the end, I, I realized that I, I focus or I'm interested more about how the, uh, the history is being told in what way how they're being narrated, in what method or channeled. So um, at the end, I feel like I have to present uh, archival materials in form of moving images. For me, it's more touching in a way that I feel like um, I want to highlight individual thoughts about the times. So um, at last, I, I put together um, two videos, one single channel video on the left, and also another one a triple channel video on the right. Uh, I may show like a, a little bit of the single channel, should I? Okay, give me a few minutes. Just a minute, ah. Uh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Because someone, I changed my... Yeah, someone is asking something, but I can't read it <laughs> in the chat box. Because it's in Chinese or Cantonese. Uh, I think you're asking um, the, the, the graffiti on the statue. Uh, is it like Dao uh, Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, yeah. Sorry, Anxi, should how should I put how should I put Dao Dao Yingdi? Um, against uh, yeah, British yeah, imperialism. Ready. Yeah, the, the graffiti is about um, is, is saying against um, British imperialism. Okay, share screen, wait a minute. Okay, maybe I'll play a section of one of the single channel video. Can you hear the, the sound? Not yet. Okay, the sound doesn't work for some reason. Maybe I'll play another one.
Sorry about that. I should prepare better. Hey, can you hear the sound? Zooms are always a bit tricky. No worries. We're all adjusting to this new model of working and sharing knowledge <laughs> right. and work. All right. And the title of this work is that it's part of a longer project. Can you guys see the video? We can only see like a, I guess just the beginning, but it's not playing. Oh, that's oh, now it, it's playing now. Yeah. Okay, that's going. Is it playing right now? Yes, it seems to be a bit but on and no. off. Yeah. Let it burn. I have been transferred to the prison of Warhampton twice anyway. The first time was in Chico, the last post in the strongest fortress. I think um, that's it for now um, because I want to switch to something else. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, give me a minute. Okay, here you go. I got it. Not this one. Um, in in the video I just showed uh, just now, um, 
many, fo uh, many footages were shot with this lens. Um, one of the characters in the film talk about using a uh, Nikon Gokaku camera that was one of the um, biggest Japanese manufacturer during the time to manufacture a uh, replica of, um, of Germany cameras. Uh, that company is now renamed into Nikon, which is one of the biggest camera manufacturers in, in, in the world. And uh, I found this lens before, uh, during my research, a lens engraved with, um, let me try to zoom in. Can I zoom in? Uh, it's stuck at some point. Make in occupied Japan. Uh, after the Second World War, when Japan was occupied um, uh, by, by the Allied, uh, mainly by the Americans. And the Americans, um, government asked Japanese to stem all luxury export goods with made in occupied Japan. Uh, uh, firstly, to restrain, um, to limit how much money Japan can make after the war in order to uh, minimize its growth. Um, secondly, it tried to insult Japan. Uh, as far as, uh, as far as we know, Jap uh, Japanese, Imperial Japanese occupied many um, territories during the war, like including um, um, Philippi uh, many Southeast Asia countries and um, Hong Kong, um, Ch uh, Manchuria, China, uh, Singapore, so on and so forth. But um, I really, when I go back to this piece of history, I think about um, from what angle I'm looking in. Um, and I feel like the equipment really matters. So I, I use this lens to, to film most of the footages. Um, it means a lot to me because it's not just a metaphor at the same, uh, the metaphor is from the eye of a colonist look into the colonization history. So um, yeah, that's why this lens means quite a lot to me. And um, I think I can talk on and on, but um, do you guys have any questions about my first um, project? Anyone from the audience have any question for Chung? Well, maybe I, I'd like to ask something about the video about the sculptures. Mm. Yeah, I, I was watching the whole video and sorry if it if I'm simplifying it, but are the voices from the sculpture perspective? Um, so you mean uh, there are three voices or three characters? Yeah, yeah the, the three film. characters are the sculptures. Uh, one is an English um, soldier. Another one is a Japanese soldier, the Japanese one. And the, the female one is, is the, um, it's not a sculpture. It's some, it's a feng shui, uh, it's like a, a ritual object underneath um, the HSBC lion in the pedestrian. Oh, I see. Because, yeah, it's quite, kind of like a strange because um, geographically uh, before the war, um, the HSBC lions, they're, they're placed, they were placed at the back of the Queen Victoria statue. So the lions, they're always watching the back in, instead of the front so, <laughs> of the statue. So um, I, I kind of, according to my, I, I, like, I, I, I imagined like how the lion would think. So I, I make it into a fictional character. Yeah, yeah. nice. Someone oh. is asking if the lens you use or can, still can still work right now the one yeah that you uh, yes i i use it quite often i i have two dead lenses one is for exhibition and another one i still keep using it every day okay um, we have one yeah. more um lam yun wa i hope i'm pronouncing it correctly sorry if i'm not um, your work is about historical statues that were captured and relocated by the Japanese occupants of Hong Kong. 
I'm curious to know your opinion on the Parthenon marbles in the British Museum. I guess it's like a question about, you know, like also objects and how they move and the violent history of like, you know, appropriating them and showing it. I don't know if it's something that um, it's also part of your thinking around statues and how they change meaning, but also mm. in different locations, but also how they get preserved and especially the British Empire that, you know, has this history of just like, you know, and not just the British Empire, but many other European countries of just like appropriating uh, and rewriting their own history through the objects and made, made by other people that not even by recognize them properly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I, I don't know because I, 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 I do not spend time on researching into, into the marbles, but at the same time, uh, that, that is one of my, my, my premises when I conduct a research that I will try to suspend nationalism before I approach the materials. So um, I will try to look into the attributes of the materials and how um, different sources, they talk about their own perspective. And then I will compare and then I will give my own thoughts afterwards. Maybe my personal opinion will arise in the middle of the research, but um, I can't comment at, the same, uh, at this moment because I, I do not research into that topic. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I think I'm, I have a question and it kind of talks to your uh, research practice and how, you know, like how long you spent time on a project and how like, you know, there is multiple like research and ar archival material that you, um, you know, you research and then it kind of becomes a larger body of work. Maybe if you can speak a little bit about your methodology, I guess. Uh, thank you, Marta. Uh, I think that is a very good question because I, at first, I start with something that intricate me, like interests me. But when I start um, sourcing and also collecting materials, I realize that there are sparkles among those materials. And then I just like, uh, for me, my methodology is like that. I put those, ma those materials into, just imagine there's a big cabinet with um, many drawers. I put those like different small details and, and sparkles into different folders or different uh, drawers. At last, I, I realized that if I think of something that I really want to um, develop into a bigger project, I would try to like, pull out drawer and then collect more materials about that topic. So this is my methodology. That, that makes me, I have to, or I am get used to, to researching into multiple topics or um, historical uh, projects at the same time because I will save more time, I can collect materials that they may contribute to different projects or they can lead to more links that they may share together. Um, just like I mentioned in the beginning of today, I, I'm researching in uh, Manchuria, uh, North Dongbei, um, uh, Northeast of China that uh, is a huge topic, but at the same time, it just leads to many, many sources. So um, for me, in, in order to make it more effective, I have to do this like multiple projects at the same time. But um, I, one of my friends visited me today, I gave him a tour that he asked me a similar question, like how can I, or how do I um, claim a project is finished? because I, like, I always collecting uh, materials. And my, I have a very the stupid answer that I, I cannot literally say I will finish a project. Like definitely, I, I cannot say that. But at the same time, I feel like when I cannot push further the narrative or I cannot give more discourse on the same, on the same topic, um, I feel like I have to put it down, put it aside and then let, let me develop another project. So um, I, 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 can, I can only say that I'm, really, uh, I'm pretty satisfied 
these two projects at, the, at this moment, but maybe I will develop more when I have more time to research in London and also British Museum. And I believe I can do more or I can prove myself wrong and I do a new, new, like, new work add on the existing ones, like existing ones. Um, it seems like we have 10 minutes more. Uh, maybe should I just like go, go through another project that is in the same solo show briefly that we can have more time for um, like discussion. Sounds great. Okay. I'm getting nervous right now, so. <laughs> okay. Ha, huh. I realize I, I don't have the photo for the other exhibition hall. Oh, okay, this one. Um, in the first, uh, I have to say, uh, I developed the second according to the first one. So it's also about occupation period in Hong Kong. And um, when Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese in 1941, um, the Japanese arrived to Hong Kong with very limited resources, such as water and food. But um, the population of Hong Kong was, was raised um, doubled for uh, one year before their arrival because um, Guangzhou or Canton, the city in the north of Hong Kong, uh, 129 kilometers uh, in the north of Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese three years before the occupation of Hong Kong. So um, the Chinese um, residents from the Guang, uh, Guangzhou uh, province, they migrate to Hong Kong in order to uh, make a living. So the population in Hong Kong was doubled from um, 800,000 to almost uh, 1 million, 1 million and, and, and a little bit more. So when the Japanese arrive in Hong Kong, they have to minimize the, um, the cost of administrations and also they have to feed their own army. So they, they, um, they uh, enact a policy called repatriation policy that they have to kick out 800,000 uh, 800, Hong Kong people um, away from Hong Kong in all means. Um, I can show you one of the news clipping. Okay, let me see. Okay, uh, sorry about that, it's in Chinese. Uh, I can explain that. It says that the Japanese um, brought residents, like Hong Kong residents to remote island and just let them to die without giving them any food or water. So um, after the war, uh, many of these kind of like cases was found on the remote islands with the skeletons and um, because the Japanese just want to kick people out of Hong Kong. And one of the ways that um, they sent boats and ships and let the Hong Kong people travel to the north. Uh, I entitled this project, it's called The Narrow Road to the Deep Sea. Um, it's still happening. I'm still adding more works to this collection. And yeah, this is pretty much what I'm working on. So these are the three routes of the Japanese sand people to the north. And the, the final destination is Guangzhou City. Uh, among these three routes. And, and there was a concentration camp, and I, I should put it in this way. There is a refugee camp uh, in, in Guangzhou city, uh, in the south of the Guangzhou city. And they call it uh, Nan Shi Tou, refugee camp, like the name of the, uh, of the community. So this is the map of the current, um, current Nan Shi Tou refugee camp right here. And, and the Japanese did not just imprison those refugees. They used those refugees as a test subjects of bacteriological and bio we uh, biological weapons. Um, for, for instance, they, they let, let them eat food with bacteria and see how, they, how their body reacts to, um, to the um, BW, uh, the ba bacteriological weapons. And I create a body of work like based off this instance and to compare with the previous um, project, I am 
it makes a big difference for this one because like um, the Japanese destroyed most of their archives, the records uh, before they surrendered uh, because they, they expect that they would be put into a war criminal tribunal after the war. So they want to make themselves clear and then they can um, flee back to Japan uh, without being sued by, by, um, by UN. And that's why I, I can hardly find, and also the origin of the archival materials, China experienced so much, uh, so many social movements ever since the establishment of new China. So um, just, just like uh, cultural revolutions. So um, those materials, they can hardly survive even now. And thirdly, I tried to, um, as a Hong, Hong Kong citizen, with the ID card of Hong Kong citizens, I, I tried to go to, um, the National Archive in Guangzhou, but I will, I'm not allowed to see the materials because of my identity. If um, I, I have to say next time I have to accompany it with a friend or uh, my partner from mainland China so I can get access to the, those materials. But um, from the way that I approach the system and how this material presented really fascinated me because I, I really like how this piece of history is being presented. And so for this project, most of the sources is based on the interviews being conducted during the 90s by two scholars in uh, mainland China. Uh, maybe, maybe I can play like a short, uh, like a video, like a section of the video I showed in the exhibition so you can grasp um, the essence of, of the whole project. Okay, give me a minute. Can you guys see it? Yeah, uh, and also, Chung, I think you have to unplug your earphones, otherwise we cannot hear the sound, because it's coming oh. from the laptop. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry about that, wait. No worries. Thank you. 开始嘅时候，我以为你先仲喺度，舐住土泥地上面微温嘅粥，喺件对面守卫室地上面铺上黑白相间嘅石砖，国民党惯用嘅黑白地砖，其实土泥地冇咁冻，我块面贴住佢哋。文所係一座井字形嘅建築，井字嘅中心係一片四方形嘅空地。每日難民喺食完飯之後都會放風兩次，歷時三十分鐘。空地中間有一座小禮堂，用嚟日常訓導嗰啲特別難民。佢哋淨係得編號，冇名㗎。我第一次就喺放風嘅時候遇到佢。三零年代係國民政府統治嘅時期，呢度係囚禁廣東省同埋香港共產黨人同埋政治犯嘅牢獄。聽日夜晚係曾經秘密搞過讀書會，而另一邊上一班。
，带住尖帽、长衫、着住皮鞋、脚镣、手铐嘅人，就被拉到斜边。佢哋一邊被虐打，一邊嗌住共產黨萬歲。而家嗰度仲係荒涼嘅山崗，同埋礦野，同埋肉葬場。當初冇諗到會嚟咁多人，佢哋淨係想用最快嘅方法解決人口問題。嗰幾個月，一到早上就有幾具屍體用木板抬出嚟。佢哋喺紙廠嘅洗木池隔離畫咗一個前坑，底部灌咗一層薄水泥，叫發骨池。喺池入邊，一層蓋過一層。呢一度需要一個水池，唔係洗的心靈。而系将生命埋入去。原本二十米阔嘅前坑都唔知堆咗几多层嘅人，之后冇水令到佢开始发臭，佢哋先撒一层白色粉末，话系消毒。卫兵从来都唔敢行近去，到咗一定要检查难民尸体嗰阵。先至用手巾按住口鼻行去睇下。佢哋不停话难民有罪。我开始嘅时候，大家都好力竭声势咁样讲，我哋无辜，无辜。不过后来我哋慢慢都相信自己真系有罪，因为咁样囚禁。先可以变得顺理成章。Um, yeah, sorry, guys. I, I think、um, this is pretty much、um, we should do because it's now、uh, nine o'clock already.、Um, but I have to I have to tell a little bit more about this film because, as I said, I right in this project I all、um, they. Most of my materials is from interviews. The left channel, right, the left、um, panel of the video, is an interview I conduct with an old lady、uh, living near、uh, the refugees camp, and she is still living. I conducted the interview last last year、uh, in the winter, so she is ninety something years old. So the character of the female character is based on、uh, the interview、uh, content. And the right channel is、uh, the the male character. Actually, he is、um, is a combination of all kinds of like interviews I read、uh, in in the scholar articles、uh, about this incident. So um, um, I have to say like what they are telling about or the、um, the expressions is、um, not entirely fictional because I, I I took it from from the interviews and also. Um, the testimony of other interviewees. So,、um, yeah, that that's the background of the production.、Um, uh, can I ask a question before we wrap up? Yeah,、uh, I'm on. I'm sorry if you don't like to be associated with this, but I can't help having this question.、Uh, do you think that your practice can be considered as an activism? Because I see that you also, even though you always emphasize on the history, but I think it's also、uh, your an action of redistributing information. So、mm -hmm. I'm just curious about it, because where my where I'm from, art and activism goes way beyond that. I don't know if it's a term that you use in Hong Kong or China. So maybe you can tell your tell me to ask your thought about it. Um, I'm not sure.、Uh, I may say yes for sometimes, like because sometimes I, I, I try to advocate how to use the material or how we should concern with a particular issues, and I can I cannot say I am an activist because I'm not fully engaged in social movement, because I feel like 
uh, I can do better as an artist because I, I'm good at like, doing artwork. But um, I have that kind of ideology in my mind that I have to let people participate in writing history. So in that sense, I may, I may advocate something about um, sharing knowledge in the public domain uh, instead of uh, initiating a movement. So you think art making and activism are two different things? Uh, they're not, not separated in most of the cases, but um, I just cannot, I'm not brave enough to say it, I'm an activist. There is Thank another you. question about um, how you choose your medium of expression. Uh, since your practice is like highly research-based, like why you decided, I guess, to do to work on like a video and, you know, photographs in, in, instead of another one. And I guess my follow-up question is also on, you know, how you think that made you that is the appropriate one for what, you know, like representing like a history that and reading an archive that it's obviously like non-objective and not complete and how you use, um, you know, your medium to like think about those questions as well and mm -hmm. uh, fragments of them. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that is a very valid question because I, in the first project, I, I, I have that lens. So the lens is part of the body of the work. Like that lens is not just a, a tool, but also that is a book. So from the lens, I can see, like for me, the empowerment comes from um, light passing through the lens and, and make images on the sensor. But for the second, I have to say that like for the second project, I start with making videos because I, when I have so much text from no matter it's interviews or um, articles or um, archival materials, I think of like how I present uh, languages and, and history in form of text through visual languages. So for me, like um, moving images is one of the most effective but very safe uh, way to um, deliver those materials and let people get into the emotion and also music and also background or visuals, color, like so on and so forth. But um, I like recently I keep criticizing myself and I feel like I have to choose uh, or I have to be more, um, I create work freely instead of using photographs because like photograph um, is part of the practice when you go to archives, you have to take records of the image or text or paper. So the camera itself is being, it become part of your body or part of your arm. And that is so easy. Like, it's just like, it's so easy for me. So I, I really want to charge myself at some point. So um, I will stop like producing um, that kind of fictional narrative film for a short time. And then I try Diff, uh, other different ways to 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 um, to deliver this that kind of like historiography, but at the same time, uh, in the exhibition I have like sculptures and also um, um, yeah photographs and also some drawings. So um, I try different things, um, but I like from in this Zoom meeting, uh, the, on, I think the most effective way is photographs and videos. So um, yeah, thank you so much for for the question. Uh, and also, yeah, writing. Writing means a lot to me. And like every, uh, every time when I've almost finished a research, I would try to write a report, like a report report with like a lot of citations and also quotes and, and, and images. But um, I, I have a conversation with my partner like recently and she said, um, you should try something like creative writing and yes, and it feels like to me like creative writing have a lot more room for me to develop and also explore and maybe i i have already tried creative writing in writing scripts for for my film but um what about creative writing as official presentation of um my my research 
or propagation as a as a as a way to to deliver or distribute my research. And uh, since last year, I, I decided every project I have to uh, I have to publicize one big uh, publication. So um, I have a new publication coming up, maybe by the end of August, if the publisher will not postpone any further. So <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, publication is one of the uh, one of the medium I'm really really interested in. Great. Can I ask a question, Chong? Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, after knowing your work for some time, I feel like um, many of the research, the original history is very heavy. It's not, um, yeah, it, it has a lot of heaviness and uh, no matter it's about uh, the colonial history or it's about the occupation. So um, I'm wondering like as an artist, how do you live with this heaviness? And, uh, and also another question is, are you very drawn by um, those histories? Just want to know more about that. Um, I, I can share um, an abnormal, abnormal experience, but um, maybe you, you will laugh, but just listen. Um, I've experienced that I visit um, the dome, the dome, atomic dome in Hiroshima in Japan, when I filmed uh, with film, uh, filmed with Super 8 film. Uh, by the time it was in the winter, and I, I took a long bus and I, I didn't take a rest. I just like head straight to the dorm to film. And at one point uh, during my filming, I have to change the film, like take the, uh, take the cassette from the film and then insert a new cassette. And I have my own body paralyzed. I cannot move for some reason. And I, by the time I spent five minutes to get my own body go back to normal, I cannot even take like my wallet from my pocket and go to 7-Eleven to buy a coffee. And for me, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to exaggerate um, the process of researching that kind of like heavy history, but at the same time, um, the procession of that history in my own body and make it into embodiment experiences is very important. Like how I put myself in that situation that I have to be part of it. And I don't know, um, my partner always like say you, you, are, you are shortening your life for, <laughs> at some point. But like for me, that embodiment is very, uh, very important. Like how um, that emotion get into myself, I digest it and, and translate it into visual language. Um, I, I split myself into two parts. Like one part is the emotional part. Another one is the very rational part. The rational part in charge of like making Excel spreadsheets, um, and putting together Google Calendar. But the other part is in charge of like making artwork. Um, sometimes they cross over, but sometimes they're two separate entities. Uh, yeah, uh, this is how I coped with the history. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. So we call last questions from the audience. You can just unmute yourself and talk yes. directly. Or even if you want to share any comments or similar experience or, you know. And also anything from Chita and Mata. Not sure. Okay, we have one. Um, and so the question is, I feel the great sadness in this film. As an artist, how do you set your position within those huge historical description. It seems like you're rebuilding the history visually and it turns into memory, uh, oh. which seems like how, you know, working with archive and working with this kind of material, you're also like presenting, uh, 
you know, another way of reading, you know, history. And I guess when you're talking about, you know, seeing a key word for you being historiography, then um, that's, yeah, how do you, how would you um, see yourself in that kind of position of like an historian and artist and archivist and yeah. Uh, I think we, yeah, that, that is my personal, personal opinion. We should not um, uh, put story, history, memory into um, separate drawers, like separate categories, because like sometimes they, inter they, uh, they are interwoven together. The way that we put history as history because it's always dominated by the authority. Because whenever you have more power, as power of saying, or you, you have more um, constitutional power, you have the power to constitute, uh, make uh, an archive, then you have more say to deliver history. And but at the same time, we, we, uh, in, in this era, we have more channels to voice out and, like, and also journalists, they can have their own perspective that is independent from the authority. And memories is important that because it carry a strong essence of personal perspective and we should not overlook that personal perspective. And even I, I start the second project with my personal history yeah, maybe I can talk just a little bit. I like years and years ago when I studied in secondary school, uh, when I have my first art class, my, my teacher brought out a sculpt, like human sculpt for life drawing, life drawing class. And I think like most of the art students, they draw that sculpt before because it tells about uh, uh, the structure of our human head. And our, our te my teacher told us uh, that that is a boys' school, like without no no girls, just boys. And they told the boys that oh, the, the skull is real. So you guys are, are drawing the real skull that is painted from the backyard. It's not a backyard from the swimming pool after the war. So my 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 secondary school was occupied by the Japanese and turned it into uh, a hospital. And that piece of memory was hidden in my body like years. But when, when I researched into the bacteriological research laboratory in Hong Kong and also uh, in Guangzhou, that memory came out, that comes out and, and surfaced that my personal history or my memory aligned with the grand, or not, maybe not the grand, aligned with the history itself. So I think there is a, there's a point that my per, our personal experiences shared with someone else. And that is important. And why these experiences, they are not told just because uh, we are individuals. So we, we should not, um, we, I think researching into history or working in history is one of the way to create a subversive force, like bottom up subversive force that led uh, the individual uh, individuals voice out their own perspective. Uh, yes, it's, it, it's difficult to work with big history or big, the huge topic. But like, I think if we dig deep into a particular spot, we will find the sparkle. So that kind of sparkle, uh, maybe they are always overlooked by the historic, not historic, but maybe they're overlooked uh, in form of grand history, but the sparkles is very important and fascinating. And also um, it can enlighten our, our perspective towards what is happening at present. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it makes me think of um, a, a class I took in graduate school, it's called Public Narrative. Um, the, basic um, idea is no matter what you do, there's always a really deep reason you're doing this. So I think maybe this personal experience kind of pushed you or kind of lead you towards to what you're making and what you're responding to. So I think it's very brave to share this and a very, um, yeah, I really appreciate you um, 
share this idea and uh, acknowledge the, the importance of it with you because not everybody uh, would um, identify with this feeling. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I may have one last word because I, I think um, after last, what, what has happened last month, like as a Hong Konger, we, we no longer, we have to bear a bigger responsibility for our speech. And I think like the way we, we the limitation for, for us to voice out in public domain is being minimized or uh, is decreasing every every single day, so um, I think like being stay uh, staying together, supporting and speaking the truth is very important for individuals, and do not be scared to do so. Thank you, Joe. So, anyone? That seems not to have a question. Oh, there's another question. Hi, Kai. We know that you are really interested in dealing with archives to and, and live in history through personal points of view. Have you ever thought about, instead of working with history that has already been written, to work as a real-time journalist, collect first-hand stories from people as your database for the present-time history? <laughs> People seem to be suggesting you to do so many things else. Uh, being a journalist, it can be, huh, it can be a good point, but um, I'm way too stupid. So, um, I mean, like, I'm not very responsive to situation. Like, whenever, uh, that is my own issue. Like, whenever I'm in something, um, I react very slowly. So, so I, I, that is not my, like, my instinct to like, just pick up my camera and film it or, or take a photo. I, I can't, I just can't do that. So, sure. but yeah, that is a good point. Uh, I think I can be more spontaneous to um, real situations. Any more questions? Yeah, always unmute yourself and speak directly. Um, well, before we, yeah. um, oh, um, Chung, do you want to share anything else or definitely, uh, we would love to see the show in person if possible in Beijing, but, um, yeah. Uh, else? Yeah, I, I think I can... open until for the people that might be in Beijing right now, I want to see it. Uh, maybe I can take like a video documentation of the show and upload it to YouTube. So um, uh, you guys can have a, have a glimpse of, of the show. Or uh, Ansi, if like, I think sometimes um, friends, they may have more questions so they can send to, to you and then yeah. you can have like a further discussion. We love to, yeah. And was there anything you want to say previously? Uh, not for now. I I I don't know. <laughs> or is there any of your research that is accessible in on the internet for the public, or some writings that we can read? Uh, let me see. Um, let me pull up something. 
Yeah, because I see I that can, people are interested in reading your works, your research. I I can, I think I can upload some of it. Because yeah, I, I think I can upload some of it, and yeah, and there share are it. some in your website. Yeah, well, I, my website is not very good, so, <laughs> uh, but I, I can upload because I, I, yeah, I'm so bad. I, I don't have much time to manage my own website, but um, yeah, I, I can definitely upload some of my, my, my writings. So I'm sharing everybody uh, Trung's website and uh, also the exhibition. Okay. Oh, perfect. Um, okay. Sharing. All right. And uh, if you miss any part of today's uh, student visit, you can always go back to Paris's um, YouTube channel. We have the recording um, of today's student visit. And uh, if you're ever interested, we have more uh, visits coming up with uh, Hong Kong artists. So yes, stay tuned. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Chitan. Thank you, Chung. Bye. Thank you, Chung. Thank you, Anshi. Thank you, Mata. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.